Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also have uh, many amendments that I hope that the committee um, uh, uh, seeks uh, favorable um, views on and approves, um, but I too am here to testify in favor of this rule. Um, I'm very grateful to each and every one of you uh, who are, are here staying in Washington, D.C. Uh, over the weekend, even after uh, many members um, have gone back to their districts for various reasons. Um, namely being they were told they could. Uh, but we are here to ensure that we are all working together to avoid a government shutdown. That is the last thing that I want. I am here to serve my constituents in Colorado's third district. I am here to fight for our veterans, for our service members. I want to ensure that agencies are functioning, that paychecks are issued, uh, and that I am able to do my job to, uh, to better serve them um, back at home. And that's why I'm here this weekend. There's plenty of events that all of us could have run off to, um, whether, whether they be official or unofficial, but we're here to do the hard work of, um, of governing. And unfortunately, we have wasted many months uh, and, and now we are here at this critical deadline of, uh, of government funding running out and us on the brink of a shutdown. But this shows a, a lot of good faith, us being here, dedicated, talking about this rule. My colleagues and I, we're, we're fighting to fund the government. We're fighting to uphold the promises that we made to the American people back in January. <laughs> We took that speaker's race very, very seriously, not because of a person, but because of the policy, because of the procedure. We wanted to ensure that we were making fundamental changes to the way Congress operates. When I go back home, people don't speak favorably of Congress and the way that we do things here. And we wanted to make sure that we had an impact to redirecting uh, the House of Representatives back to the original intent that our founders had, that we would actually do the work of the people rather than just having these straight up and down votes uh, where you have to pick and choose uh, what's worse in the bill, what's better in the bill to actually get a, a final vote on, on passage or not. Uh, I, I was very excited that the days of having to pass a bill to find out what was in it were gone. We, we've implemented, implemented 72 hours to actually read a bill before we pass it, and we promised the American people that we would no longer govern by omnibus bills. And now we're at the brink of a continuing resolution, which is very much the same. Uh, and, and, and we promised them 12 individual, single subject bills to fund the federal government. We are here to prevent the, con the, the continuation of swampy status quo that we all see each and every day up here. Um, commitments were made earlier this year to rein in reckless spending and business as usual in Washington, D.C., and we expect those commitments to be honored. There are thousands of unauthorized programs that continue to be funded without oversight, congressional hearings, or even a reauthorization vote. This is absolutely unacceptable to have thousands of unauthorized programs that we are continuing to fund without even having a discussion of how we are spending the American tax dollar. The American people deserve better than the previous majority's way of governing. Uh, the Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden bloated uh, the budget to, um, uh, and, and now we're seeking to continue that same budget. Uh, some want this continuing resolution past September 30th, and I believe that that's completely unacceptable, especially now that Republicans have the majority here in the House. The American people voted for this majority uh, to do things differently and fund the government um, in, in a new way that is not weaponized against them. Uh, we, we voted against the omnibus bill back in December, so why would anyone, any one of my colleagues on my side of the aisle, vote to continue that past September 30th? Before the August uh, district work week, uh, the House passed just one of the 12 appropriations bills to fund the government. And we were promised that progress would be made over the six weeks that we were all back in district working with, hearing from, and serving our constituents, uh, and, and that a plan would be in place when we got back. But instead, when we came back, you know, we, we welcomed $33 trillion in debt. We're looking at spending $7 trillion and only receiving $5 trillion, a $2 trillion annual deficit that we are all, uh, 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 just 
very distraught over. I'm, I'm a mom of four boys. I got a grandchildren. It is immoral for us to have a deficit this high. We have got to get the spending un under control. And while there are disagreements on uh, both sides of the aisle and, and we're stuck at a crossroads here, there is a path forward. I'm so proud of the work that my colleagues have done. Uh, it, we have moderate Republicans and the most conservative Republicans working together to actually pass these bills individually. And the House should not go home uh, this week once we begin voting without voting on these single subject uh, bills that reduce bloated federal spending and show the American people that the Republicans, the majority that they voted for, can govern. It's not just a campaign slogan, but we actually get here, roll up our sleeves, and do the work that we promised the American people that we would do. And now is absolutely not the time to quit. Uh, we cannot risk a government shutdown, and, and this is why we're all here to do this job. Um, we need to pay our brave service members. This is of the utmost importance. I've, I've heard it mentioned in this committee today. Um, they will be required to work in the event of a shutdown. And the same service members who have been subject to wokening and, uh, and weakening of our military under this current regime, um, and, and Joe Biden, Secretary Lloyd Austin, um, they're suffering already. And to withhold their pay in the midst of that it is also something that is very immoral and, uh, and not our best. So I, I want to do this by passing the, the DOD bill that will fund the military um, to win uh, every battle that we face um, in, in our upcoming future as, as the greatest um, nation. They need to have um, preparedness, military readiness, um, not just more focus on celebrating Pride Month. We also need to pay our brave border uh, security officers. These border patrol officers, if you heard, as you've heard today, they have been demoralized. I've talked to these border patrol agents um, who I've asked them, what can I do? What can I do to help you? Uh, and you know, they tell me, we don't necessarily need more personnel because they're just processing agents at that point. We don't need more infrastructure at this moment. We don't even need more resources at this moment. We need the policy that allows us to do our job. Right now, we have a president that is ignoring the rule of law, our nation's immigration laws, and he is impacting the very men and women who risk their lives each and every day to secure our country. Uh, but they are there to stop the complete and total invasion taking place at the southern border and that is infiltrating all of our states, making every state a border state, making this an issue in each one of our homes. Uh, in, in the last 30 months, Joe Biden and uh, Secretary Mayorkas have been in control of the southern border. There have been 6.9 million CBP encounters and 1.7 million known gotaways. Uh, let's do this by passing a strong DHS funding bill with strong policy writers to secure the border. And I applaud uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Chip Roy's uh, comments, saying uh, that this will get done. In funding the federal government, we will provide a solution to securing the southern border, to stopping or at least tremendously slowing down this flow of fentanyl, the tens of thousands of children that have gone missing, the deaths that have taken place, the innocent lives that have been lost because of these reckless policies. And also in the midst of a, a government shutdown, we cannot risk even the closure of our national po parks, pausing passport and visa applications, grant applications, IRS verifications, mortgage approvals, new veteran benefits, and Social Security and Medicare applications. So thank you again for putting in this work. I ask you to continue to put in this work so we can avoid a government shutdown. We can get in this together, work together, put aside differences, and find a real solution for the people who are counting on us and are losing faith in us back home. Let's prove to them that we have their best interests at heart, that we aren't up here wasting time, that we care about their future, their children, and their children's children's future as well. Let's pass all 12 appropriations bills individually, single subject, um, through the People's House before September 30th, and we can keep the government open. Uh, we can stay here and do that work that we were elected to do. I'm here to do it, my colleagues are here to do it, and I'm proud to uh, stand with you all today. 
uh, for the American people doing this work. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for the time, and I yield. Thank you. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, recognized to make uh, address any amendments he cares to. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little hurt that you didn't call me your good friend. I mean, I, <laughs> you, you've been doing that a lot today, and that's okay. I that's what we're going to have to rehabilitate. We've got to reform I'm this. I'm happy to call you my good friend. <laughs> You're just being honest. Thank you, thank, thank you Mr. Chairman. We, appre we appreciate all of you being here. I, I appreciate all of you being here, and I'm delighted to be here, and, and I appreciate the sacrifice of time you guys do. And, and you, I know you, none of you would have it any other way, except for Mr. Nagoose, maybe. I don't know, but, but, but it's, it's great to be with you. And, and I have a number of amendments that I'm going to address. I will try to address some of them more quickly and more briefly, so, but just introduce them to you so you see what it is. I'm and encouraging, and hopefully uh, you'll, you will see fit to make these in order. With regard to H.R. 4368, this is the agriculture bill. So I have a, a uh, amendment four here, and what this does is it prevents funds, funds from being used to take enforcement actions against homeopathic drug products that meet specified requirements in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. In other words, they're, they're already regulated, um, but this administration has kind of gone after them a little bit, trying to curtail them. And uh, we've actually had some bipartisan support uh, on this. I hope that the bipartisan, uh, bipartisanship sticks with it on this amendment. Uh, number five, strikes all funding for Food for Peace Title II grants and directs the total to the spending reduction account. That's $1.7 billion. Amendment six, strikes all funding for the McGovern Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutri Nutrition Program directs the total also to the spending reduction account. Amendment 64, restores funding for the Office of the Chief Information Officer to FY19 levels and to re redirects the, the gap to the spending reduction account. That's $23 million. Amendment 65 restores funding to the Office of the Chief Economist at FY16 levels, exempting the Office of Pest, Pest Management Policy, which will continue on in its current levels, directs the difference to the spending reduction account, by, uh, which is $11 million. Amendment 67 restores funding to the National Ag Statistical Service to FY19 levels. Amendment 70 restores funding to the National Institute of Food and Agricultural to F19 levels. 72 restores funding to the Ag Marketing Service to FY19 levels. Amendment 73 restores funding to the Farm Production and Conservation Business Center to FY19 levels. And Amendment 125 restores funding of the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation to FY19 levels. And 186 makes permanent rescissions in Section 722, 731, 733, 741, 748. Um, and that's the sole purpose of reducing the national debt. And all of these are designed in context of, of our problem where we, where we continue to spend significantly more than we bring in in revenue and we have to try to we have to try to embark at least at some point to to reconcile that uh, with regard to the SFOPS uh, uh, bill uh, these are the 12 amendments I have uh, filed number 133 eliminates funding for the educational and cultural exchange programs 134 eliminates funding to the US Institute of Peace 135 eliminates funding for the National Endowment for Democracy. 136 eliminates funding to the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. 137 eliminates funding to the Congressional Executive Commission on the People's Republic of China. 138 eliminates funding to the U.S. Agency for International Development. 139 eliminates funding to the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, and that's the presidential excuse me, President Capital Investment Fund. 140 eliminates funding to the Millennium Challenge Corporation in the amount of $905 billion, excuse me, million dollars. 141 eliminates funding to the Global Environment Facility. 142 eliminates funding to the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And 143 eliminates funding to the contribution to the Asian Development Fund and eliminates funding to the African Development Bank in 144. And um, that's pertaining to that bill. And I'll spend a little bit more time on these next, these next couple of bills and those amendments, if that's all right. Um, with regard to 4365, the Department of Defense Appropriations Act 2024. First is amendment number 16. 
This prohibits prohibits funding prohibits funds to sell unused border wall materials. You cannot sell the unused border wall materials. And I will I will I, uh, I have respect for for Representative Cuellar. He and I have talked about many of these issues many times, and appreciate uh, Representative Roy uh, and his leadership on this issue too. But I want to talk about this notion that walls don't work. That's an interesting notion, an interesting statement by people who live behind walls and work behind walls and fences constantly. But let's talk about, let's talk about some specific instances. The reduction in um, illegal crossings in the San Diego sector when they extended their wall to 60 miles long was 90%. I actually had the, my, my Democrat colleague from San Diego came to me and said, Andy, walls don't work. And I said, why don't they work? He said, because when we built that and expanded it to 60 miles, they just went out around the 60 miles. And I said, well, then the walls worked, right? Because they actually had to go out and around them. So if you had had 120 miles, they'd had to walk on 120. They work. Let me give you another example, Yuma, Arizona. Yuma, Arizona, where Secretary Mayorkas went there 18 months ago and said, we're going to fill in these nine gaps in the wall. We'll get it done before the end of last year. Didn't get it done. Where do you think everybody comes through in Yuma, Arizona, which is now seeing 800 to 1,200 people a day? In those nine gaps. In those nine gaps. When, those were clo when they, we closed part of it at the, at the uh, Morellis Dam, the state of Arizona and the previous governor closed part of that, kind of like on the south, south Texas border where you stuck up rail cars, right? They did the same thing by the Morellis Dam, which was uh, the number two crossing there in that area from the Cocopa to the Morellis Dam. Guess what? Nobody came through the Morellis Dam anymore. They're looking for the gaps, and there's gaps all along in that fence. And this, we should not facilitate the selling of the material that we've already paid for, that lies dormant. You can go down in Yuma, you can go down in Naco, Arizona, you can go down near Douglas, you can go in various places in Texas, all along Texas, um, and you'll see material that we've paid for. All you have to do is put it up and put it in. We have gates that are open because when the executive order came out to stop, they were, they'd actually put the gates on the hinges but they can't, they can't automate them. They can't automate them, and they need to automate them. You need the lights, you need the, pre, you need the pressure uh, uh, indicators, all of those things. In some places, you go along Douglas, you've got miles of lights sitting right there. They can't come on. Why can't they come on? Because this administration stopped the wiring. We should not be selling off the material. We should be using it to actually finish closing off the wall. I just have to wait, make one more comment. You want to know why you interdict 94% of your drugs that you interdict at, at a port of entry? Because that's where you do have the scanners. That's where you do have the personnel. That's where you do have the dogs that sniff. You know where you don't have it? Along the Tohono O'odham Reservation, 62 linear miles in southern Arizona where they have the number one gotaway rate in the country because people don't want to get caught. You want to know uh, one of the biggest drug corridors in the, in the world? Right through that reservation. This notion that, oh, we're interdicting 94% is a false data point. Because when you go and you go to the, between the ports of entry, that's where the vast majority of drugs come through. And, uh, um, there's so much more to be said about it. I know you guys are busy, um, uh, but you have 19,000 people that were in custody with CBP yesterday, 19,000. And while we were concerned about the 2,000 that crossed into Eagle Pass, you had about, uh, over that same period of time, you had more than that come through the Tucson sector and get away, and get away. If you ever want to go down there, I take people down all the time. I could take you to the San Miguel Gate. We could go two miles, two miles east of the San Miguel Gate. Where the last time I was there, I um, met, met a group of 20, 20, and we asked them what happened. 
Well, they met their coyote in Caborca, which is about two and a half miles south. They drove him up and said, you walk a mile north, not a mile, about an hour, hour and a half north, you're going to cross this four-strand fence. Just sit there and wait for the CBP to come. You know how long they were there when we came along? They'd been there for four hours because the CBP cannot even patrol. You know what the fence is there? A four-string barbed wire fence. And half of that group were under the age of five. Well, so what? So this walls don't work just doesn't seem to work for me. Um, one of the things that we've tried to get into this bill and other places, um, and it's in the NDAA bill, so when people tell me I'm concerned about the payment for CBP agents, I am too. Under the Obama administration, they took away the overtime pay for CBP agents. Took it away. And we have spent, I've spent seven years trying to get it back. Maybe we will get it back. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that it's in the NDA, but I hope that people understand that um, it's not just this bill that has demoralized our CBP agents. Amendment 223 decreases Section 8104 Ukraine security assistance and this increases the spending reduction account. That was previously made in order uh, on the prior DOD rules, both times, I think. For, that was for you, Mr. McGovern. So, 228, prohibition of funds to implement COVID-19 vaccine mandates. 229, prohibition of funds to fire any service member for failure to comply with COVID-19 vaccine mandates. 231, prohibition of funds for cluster munitions to Ukraine, which I think is one that Mr. Gates is, is already uh, working on as well. The Homeland Amendments. The reason, I, I'm not going to take a, a time unless you want me to through questions. Secretary Mayorkas has opened up our border in a way that is thoroughly unprecedented. It is dangerous and is unprecedented. I, I appreciate that if you don't see what's going on at the border, it's almost impossible to understand the reality of what it is. But um, I, I worked on with my friend, Mr. Gosar, trying to get the Holman Rule uh, enacted. So I have a Holman Rule uh, amendment here that would defund uh, Secretary Mayorkas. I believe he is responsible for um, the biggest mass migration in the history of the world. And let me tell you what it's going to be. The numbers that we have today of known gotaways, plus people who've been encountered, indicates that the, with the unknown gotaways, at the most conservative estimate being at least one to one with the known gotaways, by the time his, this administration is over, you'll be sitting at more than 10 million illegal aliens who've crossed our border. There is no doubt about that. And it is the architect of that is Secretary Mayorkas. And I've, I've introduced impeachment for him because um, for a lot of reasons. I, I, I don't have the, the, the swack with my colleagues to do that. So now we got the Holman Rule. I think the Holman Rule needs to be imposed on Secretary Mayorkas. Amendment 63 prohibits the use of funds in furtherance of the public charge ground of an admissibility rule. Amendment 66 prohibits the use of funds to implement a TSA vaccine or mask mandate. 77 prohibits the use of funds in furtherance of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals final rule, which, is, by the way, is consistent with every court opinion. And then some additional home and rules that need to be imposed. So in July, Judge Terry Dowdy released a 155-page memorandum ruling in the Missouri versus Biden censorship lawsuit, stating he believes the plaintiffs are likely to prove that federal government officials are targeting and suppressing free speech. In his ruling, he specifically prohibited Secretary Mayorkas and other named DHS employees from contacting, working with, or asking social media companies about posts protected by social media. I've offered the home, home and rule amendments to zero out the salaries of the officials still working at DHS, which that judge condemned. CISA Director Jen Easterly, CISA Director Election Security Initiative Officer Jeffrey Hale, DHS Undersecretary for the Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans Robert Silvers, and D 
DHS Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention, Samantha Vinegard. Further, Amendment 72. This is for DHS Director of Departmental GAO OIG Liaison Office, Jim Crumpaker. Mr. Crumpaker leads the Office of GAO OIG Liaison at DHS. Inspector General Kafari has repeatedly raised concerns to Mr. Crumpaker, and he's raised those concern, same concerns to me and to the House Oversight Committee in testimony under oath that DHS is obstructing the IG's oversight of efforts, specifically Inspector General Kafari's June 2023 testimony stated under oath, quote, since the fall of 2021, DHS OIG has consistently reported DHS dela delays and denials of DHS OIG's requests for information. These are requests for information that are more than 700 career profession professionals need to do their jobs and which DHS is required to provide to DHS OIG consistent with the law. I remain hopeful that DHS will improve its responsiveness to our request for information so that DHS OIG can continue to provide Congress and the public robust and timely oversight like that featured in today's hearing, close quote. Mr. Krumpiger has still failed to provide that information. If you're going to hold that position and receive that kind of salary, you are obligated to respond to the OIG. That is the law. He's chosen not to follow that law. I think that he should be subject to the Holman Rule. And I appreciate your time and your, your, your respect, and, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank